And now, Move the Sticks with Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks. Hey everybody, what's going on? DJ and Bucky here for Move the Sticks. And uh, Buck, something we've really focused on this fall, kind of a theme for us. We've really taken kind of one episode a week and we've devoted it to a conversation with a coach that that really selfishly we wanted to talk to and we wanted to learn from. And and this is a name that came up over and over again in the coaches we've talked about as, as someone who's had influence on their coaching career. So uh, I think this was a conversation we definitely had to have. Lou Holtz is one of the best coaches, if not the best coach in college football history. And so to be able to pick his brain and to really find out what he believed the core traits that you had to have to build a championship program, things that he passed along to coaches along the way, how you bounce back from poor seasons. Having the opportunity to sit down for 15 to 20 minutes with one of the legends of the game and just find out all things about building a championship program, I think it was invaluable for us. Yeah, I, I promise during this conversation, a couple things are going to happen. You're going to learn something. Uh, you're going to learn something about football. It also could translate over into business. You're going to hear some – Great stories because there is no better storyteller than Lou Holtz. You've got uh, you know, coaches he's helped develop, guys like Pete Carroll, guys like Urban Meyer got their starts under Lou Holtz. And um, you're going to hear all about those young men and the early stages of their career and whether or not Coach Holtz foresaw what was coming uh, in their future, all the success that they would have. So I do hope you enjoy this conversation. Uh, there will be a little background noise. Just giving you a heads up there. Coach Holtz uh, doing this interview in a restaurant, but kind enough to give us uh, plenty of his time. So I do hope you enjoy our conversation with Lou Holtz. All right, Buck, couldn't be more excited than to have Coach Holtz uh, joining us right now. And, Coach, I, we're going to get to your coaching career and, and philosophies and the cultures you helped build. But I want to go back to Lou Holtz as a football player. You've got to tell me, give me a quick, we're scouts. We scouted the NFL, so we want you to give us a scouting report on Lou Holtz, the football player. Well, the best way I could sum up was when Tim Brown won the highs, but I went to New York to be with him in the event he didn't win it. And Jim Nash was doing the television. They had a little bit of time. He said, do you mind if I interview you before they announce the winner? I said, that's fine. First question he asked me was, Lou Holtz, did you ever dream about winning Heisman? I said, Jim, now this on national TV. I did that all the time. I wanted to win the Heisman for three reasons. I've been the first player from Kent State to ever win it. I've been the first defensive player to ever win it. And I've been the first third teamer to ever win. He said, well, we got to move on. And that's a true story. I was, not a, I was not a great football player. That was on national TV. But uh, I, I was a good teammate. I wasn't a good player. That's awesome, Coach. That is awesome. You talk about being a good teammate. How are you able to take your experiences as maybe a backup player and translate them into being a guy that became one of the best coaches in college football history? I think it was an asset because what I learned was how important it was for the second and third team and for our attitude and how it could be so frustrating as an athlete not to be able to do things naturally like some of the great football players were. So you had to rely on technique, you had to rely on attitude, you had to rely on your teammates being able to contribute. Maybe I wouldn't be very good, but I tried to make my teammates better by encouraging them, by helping them, and most important of all, by doing the job to the best of my ability. Coach, when you when you take over a program, you got a chance to take over a lot of different programs. I'm just curious, first time as a head coach, that, that first speech, that first uh, me team meeting, what your message was, and if in the other stops along the way, if, if that message changed from you? It did change an awful lot. One of the first things I would say is, gentlemen, I know you had no choice whatsoever who would be the head football coach here. They didn't ask you your opinion. You didn't get a chance to vote. I also know that if you did have an opinion, I wouldn't be here because you heard I'm a disciplinary and how tough I am. I understand you aren't excited about being here. But I do think it's important for you to understand one thing. I had a choice. I had a great job. I didn't need to move my family. I need, didn't need to leave a great situation. I came here because I thought if we worked together, we could really and truly achieve something great. And that we're going to do three things. We're going to be able to trust one another. We're going to be committed to excellence. We're going to care about one another. And nobody's going to outwork us. Nobody's going to out physical us. Nobody's going to be better fundamentally than we are. What's fascinating about you, like, given all of the success, uh, choosing to take over downtrodden programs. I happen to see your, your story about taking over South Carolina and how the struggles were early and how you were resolute in bringing it back. 
when you've been successful at previous places and it takes a little longer to turn it around, how are you able to still dig down deep and continue to believe in the values that you believe in? I think that if you're willing to want to do something bad enough, you'll find a way. If you want to achieve something, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll find an excuse. Excuse is a lot easier to find than solution. I also think it's important to make sure that you never sacrifice, uh, uh, make a short-range decision that will sacrifice your long-range goal. For example, maybe I had to suspend some athletes at Arkansas my first year. But that, that was more critical because if you don't, you're going to establish a culture that is not going to be conducive to making good young men as well as good football players. I never felt I coached football. I felt I coached life. I love that, uh, coaching life. Uh, Coach, when, when I look at the way your team's played, you mentioned how you're going to be tough and physical and you're going to be detail-oriented, and that's the way those teams played. You had a chance to take that Notre Dame team and play on the biggest stage there was. I mean, all your games were obviously national television at that time, um, and you guys were on a big stage. But the biggest moments, it seemed like your team more often than not rose to that occasion. What was the key to not go outside yourself on the big stage in those big moments? Well, in 88, we beat six teams and faced the final top ten. We beat three teams who were either one or two, and that was because we were one if they were two. In 89, we beat seven conference champions, so we're used to playing in big games. However, Jeez. when you get a big game, as I would tell the players, every time you win a game, the next play, next game becomes even bigger. Uh, maybe we just beat Miami, and now we're playing Navy. Well, Navy was more important to us than what Miami was, because if we lost to Navy, everything else was ruined, ruined over what we had done previously. And in a big game, the main thing we tried to get the athletes to do, one, you had to convince them they could win. When we're playing Miami, they'd won 34 games in a row, and at the end of the first quarter, they're changing ends of the field. Steve Stam, uh, our outside linebacker, told me that Searles, our All-American tackle, said to him, this game's going to go down the wire, isn't it? Because he knew that we believed that we could win. That's number one. Number two, give your players something they can do and demand they do it. Uh, I always felt that if I give you something to do, it's my obligation to design a play and defense the center to enable you to be successful. But the last thing, and perhaps the most important thing, don't let your teammates down. You want to fail, you have the right to fail. Nobody has the right to cause other people to fail because you don't fulfill your obligations. You join the military, you join a team, you join a business, you join a spouse, you bring a child to work. You have obligation, you must, uh, 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 must undertake them and fulfill them to the best of your ability. People say, what's the difference today and when I was younger? Today, everybody talks about the rights and privileges. When I was younger, we talked about our obligation, our responsibilities. I'm one of these old-fashioned people that believe that you have obligation and responsibility. You must absolutely fulfill it, and I'm not going to accept anything less. But as Woody Hayes told me, your job as a head coach is not to be well-liked. Your job is to make them the very best they can be. And most people don't want to get out of their comfort zone, but your obligation is to force them to believe how good they can be. All right, Coach, so I, I got a big question for you. I am a first-time head coach. I just completed my first season. Uh, we had a winning season, first time in a decade. So now the biggest challenge is to go from good to great. What advice would you give me to help me make my team go from good to great in that second season? Well, first thing, if what you did yesterday looks big to you, then you haven't done much today. I think you go through four stages with a football program. First, you learn how to be competitive. We learn how to compete, how to fight, etc. The second stage, you learn how to win. Third stage is you learn how to handle winning. Not everybody can handle winning, because when you start winning, everybody wants to get credit, and everybody wants all the accolades, and then jealousy steps in. But then the fourth step, you learn how to win championships. You win championships by doing little things. Little things make the difference. I would say a nail was lost because the nail was lost, the shoe was lost because the shoe was lost, the horse was lost because the horse was lost, the rider was lost because the rider was lost, the message was lost because the message was lost, the battle was lost because the battle was lost, the war was lost. Just do little things the right way. I love that, Coach. I, I want to go back to your time. You mentioned it briefly there at Arkansas. Young GA there for you at the time, somebody that, that we've spent a lot of time getting to know when he was at USC and obviously what he's done with the Seattle Seahawks, Pete Carroll. Um, Pete Carroll's enthusiasm, was that apparent when he was a GA, or is that something that grew and evolved over his coaching career? No, Pete was natural from the first moment I met him. 
He played at a little school in California. I forget the name of it. I think they've given up. Pacific, yeah. Now. Yeah, I, I said they give given up because of you or... Or was that the just result? But he, <laughs> he was a great coach. He, he had a love of the game. Uh, he worked with our defensive backfield. Uh, just a tremendous individual and a great coach. It was, you could tell. You can always tell when somebody's going to be a great coach. They have a love, they have a naturalness about it, and they enjoy being with the athlete. You know, Coach, football has changed since your heyday, <laughs> since your prime. Now we're seeing guys throw it all over the yard. We're seeing passing uh, more than we ever have. If you were playing, if you were coaching a team right now, what would be your style of play? What do you believe wins games throughout the course of time? I think execution. I think you could win with any way. I'm one of these old enough people. You say, oh, this is unique. Let me tell you, I started in the single way where they snapped the ball to a back, possibly five <laughs> yards deep. It was the old single way. Then we went to the split T. Then we went to the veer. Then we went to the power eye like Southern Cal did. And then we went to the uh, the far west offense, so to speak. And then we <laughs> went to the shotgun. So here we are, right back again. But what I would do, I'd look at our personnel, say what they're capable of doing. What I would really like to do, I'd like to be in the shotgun. I'd like to be able to run the football. I'd like to be able to have some options, definitely some options, which forces the defense to play disciplined defense. They can't run no blitzes, four men, one side, et cetera. What run all option would be able to run the football. If you run the football, you can then run play action passing. Most big plays will come because of play action passing. And I would just look at it that way. On defense against the spread, you gotta get pass rush with four players. If you can't get pressure with four players, you're gonna have problems because you can't be stay man to man forever. So number one, you get pressure for a man. Number two, you gotta play some decent man coverage. You've gotta at least be in the same zip code with them. And then most important of all, you gotta be able to tackle in an open field. And if you can't tackle in an open field, you're gonna have problems. You look back, anytime Alabama has trouble is when they can't get pressure with a four man rush because no defensive back can stay with the receivers from LSU for that much long and, and that's why Burroughs had such a field day. He's a very talented quarterback, knew the defense, threw the ball on time, but he could get rid of the ball without people from being in his face. It's very hard to throw a ball from a supine position. <laughs> supine. Uh, as a quarterback, I can appreciate that. Uh, Coach, speaking on quarterbacks, you had a chance to be around some really good ones. You coached against a lot of great ones as well. Um, it, when we're scouting, evaluating guys, if you had to just kind of boil it down to the two, three, or four things that you feel like make a great quarterback, what, what are they? Well, I never worried about height, weight, et cetera. I would say to an individual, if your feet touch the ground, you're tall enough. If they don't reach the ground, you're too short. We can't use you. That was a criteria. So I don't care about it. All I want to know is two things. Productivity. Don't tell me how far he threw the ball, how fast he went, how productive is he. Don't tell me about how great, how high he can jump, how many tackles he make. So I, I want to look at productivity. The second thing I want is somebody that respects other people and you will respect him as well. I never recruited a young man and I didn't go into his home. I wanted to go into his home because I wanted to see the respect they have for their parents. If they don't respect their parents, there's no way in this world he's going to succeed in life and particularly in our program. So if you respect other people, they respect you. And if you just have are productive, that's all I need. I will find an offense to enable you to be successful, whether we're running it, running the option, throwing the ball, etc. Steve Burley, great young man. Uh, he won very fast. If he got the race with a pregnant mother, the best he'd finish would be third. I understand that. But he could throw the ball, he could read, he could do these different things, and we, we adjusted our offense to him. Tony Rice, he did it different. Rick Myers certainly different. So take the players, and, and what you want to do is what they're capable of doing. Give them a chance to be successful. You know, Coach, you, you have certainly impacted some great coaches. Urban Meyer is one, but I want to talk about a guy that maybe doesn't get talked about enough. How about Barry Alvarez? Barry Alvarez left, went to Wisconsin, built a powerhouse in Wisconsin. What trace did you see in him that maybe led you to believe that he would be a really good college coach? Well, we hired him out of Iowa. He's one of the few coaches to ever leave Iowa. And then I made him defensive coordinator. We had great success. And I'll never forget, we're getting ready to play Colorado and yours. Very competitive coach at halftime. 
They're going to announce that I'm going to take the Wisconsin job. I said, hell, Barry, I can do better than that for you. You don't want to go there. That's a graveyard. I'll get you a good job. He's like, coach, I think I can win there. I said, Barry, you're a hell of a coach, but I'm not sure. You you know, you can't bring them back from the dead. He said, coach, I just want to go there. And and lo and behold, so we stayed in touch. And, And the mistake Notre Dame made, I mean this sincerely, they did hire Barry Alvarez to place me when I left Notre Dame because he loved Notre Dame. I think he would have came, and Notre Dame's history would have been completely different. Wow, that is a great story. Coach, this is the last one that we're going to let you run. We can't thank you enough for your time, but we've had a chance to talk to dozens and dozens of college coaches and ask them the same question, and the answers we get have been outstanding. Uh, the best high school football player that Lou Holtz has ever seen. It could be somebody that, that played for you. It could be somebody you, you just watched play high school that went somewhere else. But who was the most impressive high school football player you've ever seen? Well, there were a lot of them, but the one that stands out was Randy Boss. I mean, he yes. was a man with boy. Uh, and I went down to recruit him. He had two chairs in his living room. His mother sat one, I sat on the other. He sat on the armchair of his mother, showed her the greatest respect. I said, boy, this guy's going to really be special. He signed a national letter of intent at Notre Dame and was admitted to the University of Notre Dame. In May, the admissions officer said, I got a letter from somebody saying he doesn't belong to Notre Dame, and I'm going to reject his admission. And they did in May. And, and it was so unfair because he was such a class act. I think his life would have been a little different had he come to Notre Dame. But there was a player on his team also named Bobby Howard. We recruited Bobby Howard as well. They were both out of Charleston. I never went to Charleston where I visited Randy and uh, Bobby at the same time. I didn't want Bobby to think he was second rate. Bobby ended up being a captain in our day, played five years with the Chicago Bears. But Randy Boss was just, it, it was like a bad player voice. As a matter of fact, I then went down visiting with him and urged him to go to Florida State because I thought Bobby Bound did the best job with great athletes and Randy was a great. And I'll tell you how good I thought he was. Right. Never in my career did I ever do anything like this. I called Jerry Jones. I recruited Steve Jones from Little Rock Catholic. He played for me in Arkansas, Jerry's son. I said, Jerry, you ought to draft this guy. He's ready for the NFL now. They said, we can't draft somebody out of high school. That's how good I thought Randy Boss was. Wow. And he's a good person. And you look at him today on TV, he, he's a class act. But Jerry Jones will verify it. I called him, said, you ought to draft him. Wow. That is, Coach, that is phenomenal. What a great story. We can't thank you enough for your time. We've been uh, longtime admirers of, of the job that you've done, and not only as a football coach, but as a leader and, and somebody that's had a lot of impact and influence on a lot of the great coaches around the country. Uh, so thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Sometimes talk about my son at Louisiana Tech. He's won five bowl games in a row. He's 8-1, and one, only lost to Texas. And he says, he's the only coach to ever win five bowl games. Oh, I said, but I won five bowl games with five different teams. That's a little bit harder. But I'm <laughs> proud of him. I, I, no, he's I'm doing glad, a great job. I, I think you need to thank Steve Cord here, who I'm getting ready to have a drink with, but he's been very kind. He and his beautiful <laughs> wife to wait. You need to thank Christy, who set this all up, and you need to send me a check, and we'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding you. Just have a good time. Have a good hey, awesome. Coach, the water's on us. The water's on us. Enjoy lunch. And get the floating delight. Water with a lemonade and a toothpick. Take care. Bye Thanks, now. Coach. Thanks, Coach. See you, Coach. Thank you. Bye. Well, there you go, Buck. Uh, the great Lou Holtz, who... I, I, I told everybody before the interview, I promise you're going to laugh. I promise you're going to learn. And uh, I did a little bit of both on this one. Yeah, no, he, look, he's, he's a great storyteller, but even better team builder. And I think you hear him go into what I call public speaking mode when he's talking to us. I think he was definitely trying to inspire not only us, but those that were listening. Um, I think the main takeaway that I got from him was talking about building a winning team and bouncing back from that disappointing season in South Carolina and being resolute and steadfast in his belief that he could turn it around. I think a lot of times when we're in business or coaching, you you do have a tendency to have some self-doubts when things don't go according to plan. 
but he talked about how you dig yourself out of it. No one really cares. They're not going to feel sorry for you. So you got to look inward uh, to find the answers. Um, I think those lessons are things that trans, transcend just sports. I think those things are life lessons that anyone can use. I thought it was fascinating about uh, what kind of offense and what key things he would mm. want if he were to be coaching today. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a great, great conversation. And, and to me, um, really kind of goes into what's taking place at the NFL level right now, where if you look at the, the top quarterbacks in the league, uh, all of them have the ability to extend plays. All of them have the ability to be at least a threat as a runner, which is a forcing you to account for them, which really goes back to the old option days, right? I mean, you had yes. to account – for the quarterback as a runner. Maybe not in the volume that they did back in the Notre Dame days, um, but I think that makes uh, life so much more difficult on the defensive side of the ball when you have to count for the quarterback. It definitely does. It evens up the advantage. Uh, on, on defense, you typically have a plus one advantage because the quarterback isn't a runner, so it gives you the freedom to use the extra defender in the box to stop the running game. Well, now when the quarterback is a viable threat, it evens out the playing field, and it makes it – more difficult to defend the running game. You have to commit that guy to make sure someone is on the quarterback, someone is always on the running back. And we have seen how it has really kind of revolutionized the college game. But now in the pros, we're seeing it with Lamar Jackson and some of the other guys. When your quarterback is a runner, it just changes the dynamic. And so I certainly can understand why Lou Holtz was a big proponent of having an athletic quarterback, having an offense that has some option principles to it, while still spreading it out and doing that. I just think it's funny to hear him talk about about his evolution from single wing to split T, the veer to I formation option to spread and all those other things. The, the testament of a good coach is being able to be adaptable and flexible and for him to have so much knowledge of so many different offensive schemes and to really put them into practice kind of speaks volumes about his reservoir of knowledge. Uh, no doubt. Also uh, enjoyed the, uh, the little nugget there on Randy Moss, best high school How about football that? player that he's ever seen. What could have been there at Notre Dame? Uh, think about the impact he would have had there. So anyways, a, a fascinating conversation with Coach Lou Holtz. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as we have. If you've missed any of our other coaching interviews, go back. You can find them. Just go through. Uh, go on Apple Podcasts. Look at our previous episodes. You'll find great conversations with Dabo Sweeney, with Urban Meyer, uh, with Mac Brown, with Scott Satterfield, uh, Eli Drinkwitz, uh, on and on and on. We've had a chance to talk to so many coaches, and uh, hopefully you get a chance to, to listen to those if you haven't already. Well, that's going to do it for us today. Thank you so much for listening, for downloading. If you have any questions for us, Get on Apple Podcasts and uh, leave us a little rating and a review and you pop a question in there. We will do our best to answer it each and every Thursday. That's going to do it for us. He's Bucky Brooks. I'm Daniel Jeremiah. We'll catch you next time. 